here. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Alan Buchanan. So Alan is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of Arizona. He works in moral philosophy, social and political philosophy, focusing in particular on moral change and moral progress, human rights, and the evolution of, of ideology. And his most recent books include Our Moral Fate, Evolution and the Escape from Tribalism. And I'm very happy to say we have it for our library now. <laughs> and uh, other books include um, The Evolution of Moral Progress, Institutionalizing the Just War, The Heart of Human Rights, Better Than Human, and, and many others. So, Alan, it's a great honor to have you with us today. And well, thank you for inviting me. And we're looking forward to, to, to learn about ideology and uh, the exploratory okay. power. The floor is well, good. let me first say that uh, what I'm going to present today goes far beyond the paper that was circulated in advance. I'm hoping that people have read the paper, so I'm not going to, to recapitulate what's in the, the paper. Instead, I'm going to build on it because since uh, I sent you the paper, I've had some further thoughts and uh, developed a better understanding, I hope, of what ideologies are and of why they're important for uh, moral progress, especially with respect to justice. So I'm going to be talking about the explanatory power of a general concept of ideology. I'll develop what I call the general concept. And it's general in the sense that it is intended to cover a variety of different types of ideologies, racist, sexist ideologies, ideologies that support the existing oppressive social order and revolutionary ideologies, ideologies which challenge them, the existing order. Next slide, please. Now, first, let me say a bit about the relevance of ideology to structural oppression and the road to justice, the theme of this conference. First, it's generally acknowledged that ideologies support structural injustice and erect obstacles to progress toward justice, and that they do so in part by underwriting oppressive speech. Second, the possibility that there can be revolutionary ideologies raises the question of whether ideologies can ever contribute to liberation from oppression rather than support oppression. And third, moral and political philosophers concerned with oppression and progress toward justice need to understand ideologies in order to reduce the risk that their own work is distorted by ideological biases. You know, I think it's sort of interesting that uh, every moral and political philosopher I know thinks that even some of the greatest figures in the history of moral and political philosophy, people like Kant and Rousseau and Locke, uh, were afflicted by ideologically uh, distorted beliefs. And yet most contemporary philosophers don't think they have to come to terms with ideology and ask themselves the hard question of whether their thinking is similarly distorted by ideological bias. And that, that to me is a little disturbing. Well, for all of these reasons, it's worthwhile to develop a general concept of ideology, one that can encompass revolutionary ideologies as well as ideologies that support existing oppressive orders, and to explore the, the explanatory power of such a concept. That is, what kinds of phenomena can this concept be used to elucidate? Next slide, please. Now, before we start trying to develop a general concept, we need to know what we're looking for. We need to have a set of desiderata that such a concept should satisfy. And these are, I think, some fairly obvious ones. First, it should capture the intuition that ideologies provide a shared evaluative orientation in the social world that facilitates coordination and mobilization in favor of or against positions on important social and political issues. That is, ideologies have a practical function and the, the concept should capture that. Second, the general concept should include the notion that ideological thinking is distorted, especially by being oversimplified, tending to present matters in either or black and white terms. Third, the general concept should acknowledge and explain the fact that ideologically, ideological beliefs 
are robustly recalcitrant to correction. This is what I call the doxastic immune system aspect of ideologies. Fourth, the general concept should foreground the idea that ideologies function to legitimate the exercise of power while misrepresenting the consequences of its exercise and providing an inaccurate picture of the motivations and interests of those who wield the power that the ideology confers on them. Fifth, the general concept should either accommodate the possibility of revolutionary ideologies or explain why there are none. And let me just say, I find it interesting that critical theorists generally don't talk about revolutionary ideologies. They talk about ideologies uh, of what I call the status quo type, that is ideologies that function to support existing oppressive social orders. They don't explore the possibility of ideologies that would challenge the existing oppressive order, revolutionary ideologies. And finally, if the concept accommodates both revolutionary ideologies and status quo supporting ideologies, it should reveal what they have in common. Next slide, please. So here's my proposal for a general concept of ideology that satisfies these desiderata, and it's fairly complicated. First, Ideologies are systematically related, though not necessarily consistent, ensembles of beliefs, attitudes, moral sentiments, and cognitive processes for managing beliefs that together constitute a simplified evaluative map of the social world, a map in which groups are usually prominent landmarks. The evaluative map that the ideology provides offers, at least implicitly, an account of what is good or just in a social order and what is bad or unjust. And in most cases includes the idea that certain groups are responsible for what's bad or unjust and other groups are responsible for what's good or just, or at least have the potential to be a collective agent to make things better. Ideologies include doxastic immune systems, that is cognitive processes for managing beliefs and perceptions in ways that preserve their constituent beliefs in the face of conflicting evidence or testimony. Finally, ideologies facilitate the exercise of power by legitimating it, while misrepresenting or disguising the motivations and interests of those who wield power, and discounting or obscuring entirely the risks of the exercise of power that they legitimate. Next slide, please. Now, here are some things that I think the general concept, as I've just sketched it, can explain. That is, these are features of the explanatory domain of the general concept. It can help explain why the oppressed often fail to revolt, why they sometimes do revolt, why revolutionary conflicts are often exceptionally violent, why there can be revolutionary ideologies, ideologies that challenge the existing oppressive order, as well as status quo ideologies, ideologies that support an existing oppressive order. And it can explain why revolutions tend to produce new oppressive orders. Next slide, please. Now, first, I want to try to sketch how ideologies can prevent revolts against oppression. I think in three basic ways. First, by convincing the oppressed that the order is natural and hence inevitable in some way, or even perhaps proper because it's natural. Second, by convincing them that their disadvantages are their own fault or a matter of bad luck rather than a result of oppression. Third, by convincing the oppressed that they lack the power, the effective agency to overthrow the oppressive order. And this is often accomplished by the ideology instilling a sense of inferiority vis-a-vis -vis their oppressors. Next slide, please. On the other hand, ideologies can also facilitate revolt under certain conditions in two ways by including moral elements that serve as exclusionary reasons, thereby forestalling collective action problems that result from the calculation of costs and benefits of participating in revolutionary action. 
Second, by including moral elements and accompanying moral motivations that prompt individuals to act against the oppressive order, even when they lack assurance that sufficient others will do so. In other words, these two aspects explain how ideologies can overcome both the free rider problem and the assurance problem as obstacles to collective action. Next, please. Now, I want to make a prima facie case for the existence of revolutionary ideologies. It may seem odd to some of you that I think I need to do this. You might think it's obvious that there are revolutionary ideologies, but in fact, uh, to my knowledge, most of the people working in the critical theory tradition, including uh, contemporary philosophers, don't talk about revolutionary ideologies. And when they define ideologies, they say they are uh, systems of beliefs and cognitive processes and attitudes that support existing oppressive orders. And that would seem to uh, exclude revolutionary ideologies from their concept of ideology. So here's why I think we should think seriously about the possibility of revolutionary ideologies and why we should try to develop a general concept that covers both status quo ideologies and revolutionary ideologies. First, although critical theorists tend to think that ideologies only serve to support not to challenge existing oppressive social orders, many historians of revolution hold that there are revolutionary ideologies and that they have played a significant causal role in some of the most consequential revolutions, should be an S there. Uh, for example, Jacobin ideology as an explanatory factor in the French Revolution, especially with respect to its violence, and I'll just mention a couple of, of preeminent scholars of the French Revolution who assign a major role to Jacobin ideology in explaining what happened in the revolution, especially in explaining the extreme violence uh, culminating in 1794, the year of the terror. Uh, I would just mention uh, Auguste Furet uh, in his book, Interpreting the French Revolution and R.R. Palmer in 12 Who Ruled. Similarly, Bolshevik ideology, later called Marxist-Leninist ideology, um, seems to be an important explanatory factor in the Russian Revolution, at least according to all of the books on the Russian Revolution I've read recently, including Stephen Kotkin's uh, volume one of his biography of Stalin, Richard Pipe's The Russian Revolution, Orlando Feig's The People's Tragedy, uh, and the list goes on and on. I, I don't know of any scholars of the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution who don't assign some significant role to revolutionary ideologies. Next slide, please. A question, is there a general concept of ideology that can accommodate the revolutionary ideologies while still preserving the insights of critical theorists who have focused on status quo ideologies, those that support existing oppressive social orders and a concept that can capture the central idea that ideologies foster oppression. Yes, the general concept sketched earlier, both revolutionary ideologies and status quo ideologies foster oppression by legitimating power while mischaracterizing it and those who wield it in ways that foster its oppressive use and by providing exculpatory explanations of the apparent failures of those upon the ideologies, upon whom the ideologies confer power. And the, the exculpatory explanations typically take the form of conspiracy theories. Next slide, please. So here, here's how I'll flesh out the idea. With respect to status quo ideologies, critical theorists have shown how they legitimize power while misrepresenting the consequences of its exercise and misrepresenting the motivations and the interests of those who wield power. So the project is to show how the same is true of revolutionary ideologies, ideologies that challenge an existing oppressive order. And I'll begin this project by examining key features of Jacobin and Marxist-Leninist ideologies. Next slide, please. First, Jacobin ideology, and here I'm just drawing on uh, the work of uh, Fillet and Palmer and others uh, who have written extensively about the role of Jacobin ideology in the French Revolution. So here are some of the key ideas uh, that are constitutive of that ideology. The people have absolute sovereignty. 
the will of the people is wholly unified and infallible in its determinations. And here we, we, we hear the voice of Rousseau speaking. And uh, it's interesting that one of the, the, the uh, initial acts of the Revolutionary Convention was to uh, inter Rousseau's remains in the Pantheon, acknowledging the importance of his ideas in the French Revolution. Third, those and only those who personify or accurately transmit the will of the people are entitled to use any means to further the revolution and they exemplify perfect virtue. Fourth, those who oppose the revolution are not part of the people, but instead are its mortal enemies. This idea I think first occurred in uh, Abbe Sayez's uh, pamphlet, uh, what is the third estate? At that point, he says basically that the clergy and the aristocrats and the monarchs are not part of the people and that the people are to govern. Uh, and this idea gains currency. Fifth, the revolution is threatened by conspiracies, the aristocratic plot, the foreign plot. Next, if revolutionary leaders are found to be at fault, it is because all along they were traitors to the revolution. It's not that they're inept or mistaken or venal, it's that they were all along the enemy. And by the way, that was the kind of reasoning that was used first by um, Robespierre to engineer the execution of Danton and later uh, by leaders of the convention to engineer the execution of Robespierre and Saint-Just. And finally, all failures of the revolutionary project are due to traitors. Next slide, please. Now, I think that the, the Bolshevik or Marxist-Leninist ideology has virtually the same elements, although of course there are major differences. The, the Marxist-Leninist view is embedded in a theory of history um, uh, and uh, the idea that it is, it is um, contradictions between the modes of production, the relations of production that are the engine of revolution, but it, nonetheless, it has these similar elements. First, again, the idea that the revolution is a no holds barred conflict uh, between groups, in this case, classes. Second, the revolutionary leadership, those who act as agents of the proletariat and represent their interests are entitled to use any means to further the revolutionary project. They enjoy absolute authority due to the absolute authority of the class they represent. Third, the proletariat represents the best universal interest of humanity. The bourgeoisie are the implacable opponents of that interest. So again, this is the sort of black and white uh, Manichaean view of the struggle that you also get in the Jacobin ideology. Fourth, apparent failures of the revolution are due to the actions of class enemies. Fifth, when those who claim to support the revolution, including leaders, are found to have erred, their errors are not due to honest mistakes or ineptitude. Instead, they were class enemies all along. And finally, all apparent failures of the revolution are due to conspiracies. Next slide, please. So here's some commonalities of these two revolutionary ideologies. First, they legitimate the exercise of absolute power, unconstrained by any moral principles. Second, they misrepresent the motives and interest of those upon whom they confer power, thereby discounting or ignoring the risks of the abuse of power that they confer. Third, they provide exculpatory explanations that allow the continuation of absolute power. And fourth, they provide resources for overthrowing the existing oppressive order that are also resources for creating and sustaining a new oppressive order. Next slide, please. So here's a mistake to avoid. And I think it's a mistake that many critical theorists implicitly make. That is inferring from the fact that ideologies are grounded in oppressive social orders, the conclusion that ideologies only support existing oppressive social orders, thereby overlooking the possibility that there are revolutionary ideologies. The general concept that I've sketched shows how, although all ideologies support oppressive social orders, there can be revolutionary ideologies. They challenge the existing oppressive order 
but in doing so, foster unaccountable power that tends to produce a new progressive order. So contemporary critical theorists are right to hold, I think here are people like Sally Haslinger, Tommy Shelby, they're right to hold that ideologies support oppressive social orders, but wrong to rule out revolutionary ideologies. Next slide, please. Oops, I guess that's it. Um, well, let me just add a couple of things. Uh, I think when uh, critical theorists generally think about how to liberate ourselves from oppression, they think it's important to dismantle or counteract status quo ideologies, those that support the existing oppressive order. And they either think this is done through some sort of rational discourse exposing the falsehoods and biases of the status quo ideology, or they think it's by that plus sort of disruptive acts, acts which somehow reveal uh, the failures of the status quo ideology. But to my knowledge, they don't typically think that we become liberated by adopting a revolutionary ideology, uh, an ideology that challenges the status quo ideology and hence the existing social order. And I think this is interesting because my understanding is that um, both historians of the French and Russian revolution and revolutionary leaders like Lenin, for example, think that one of the important weapons for overcoming oppression is to instill a revolutionary ideology in the masses. So that, that's why I, I got interested in thinking about revolutionary ideologies and then trying to think about, well, is there a general concept that would cover both ideologies that support existing oppressive orders and ideologies that challenge them? Now, you might think that I'm being sort of hard on revolutionary ideologies because I'm presenting them as providing resources for new forms of oppression. Well, um, I'm ambivalent about this. You could have a, a much broader conception of ideology that would include systems of beliefs and attitudes which can mobilize people to challenge an existing oppressive order but which wouldn't include these resources for creating new oppression. I mean, you might think there could be such a thing. I'm just not sure that I would call it an ideology. Uh, I think it's important to preserve the insights of the critical theorist focus on what I call status quo ideologies, ideologies that support existing oppressive orders. That is, I think you have to maintain in your general concept the idea that ideologies support oppression. And if you do that, and if you wanna recognize that there are revolutionary ideologies, then you end up with a pretty unsavory view of revolutionary ideologies. But it's one that helps you explain why in most cases, revolutionary revolutions produce new forms of oppression. So I think, I think that's valuable. Now, uh, there are some implications here, I think, for moral and political philosophers. And one of them is that if you consider yourself to be a kind of radical critic of the existing social and political order, that is, if you not only advocate change, but revolutionary change, then I think you have to ask yourself whether you're in the grip of a revolutionary ideology. And if you are, then if my analysis of revolutionary ideologies is correct, then you should be worried because what you're advocating uh, by way of fundamentally altering the existing oppressive order may in fact be something which is contributing to the creation of a new oppressive order. Now, this brings me back to what I said at the beginning of the, of the discussion, and that is that I find it a little troubling that ideology isn't a more prominent topic in contemporary moral and political philosophy. I mean, wonderful work has been done by uh, Sally Hasslinger and Tommy Shelby and, and others 
uh, but it's not had a huge effect on the main research agenda of moral and political philosophy, as with a lot of contributions in race theory and uh, feminist philosophy, you know, it's good work and it's valuable, but it's been sort of compartmentalized and it hasn't really had the impact that it should have. And I just, frankly, I don't understand how anybody could begin to do moral and political philosophy without trying to come to terms with the idea of ideology. You know, Michael Frieden once said that ideology is like bad breath. You notice it in others, but not yourself. I think there's a lot to that. Um, now, it's interesting that when I looked in this, the Stanford Online Encyclopedia of Philosophy, to my amazement, I saw there was no entry on ideology. And this just confirmed my view that, you know, something is really radically wrong with what's going on in, in our discipline. So I, I've now written an entry, uh, co-authored with Elizabeth Levinson and, and Alex uh, Muchelski. It's under review now. Uh, but I just find it shocking that there wasn't any um, entry on it. Also, a few years ago, I noticed there was no entry on revolution. So I wrote one on it. And it's now uh, in the encyclopedia. And uh, just as a, a kind of aside, I'd suggest that uh, one way of diagnosing uh, what's missing in contemporary work in philosophy is to see what's missing in by way of entries in the, in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. <laughs> that would be a, a sort of interesting exercise to go through. Uh, and I would suspect that part of the explanation of things being missing that shouldn't be missing is ideological. <laughs> that is that we're seeing the effects of ideology on the part of philosophers in terms of what they think are, are, are worthy topics of investigation and which ones aren't. Okay, well, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Alan. That was wonderful. Thank you. And I love the, the shift towards the evolution, revolutionary ideology. Uh, yeah, revolutions are needed. <laughs> oh, and by the way, let me just say, in a way, I'm not really criticizing the critical theorist focus on what I call status quo ideologies, because I think they really get the right point. They get the point that ideologies uh, legitimize power in ways that make it unaccountable and abusable and which perpetuate its abuses. I think that's exactly right. Uh, uh, and so I, I think you know, they're correct in saying that that's what ideologies do. It's just that they may be making a, a mistake then in assuming that ideologies only function to support existing oppressive orders and overlooking uh, revolutionary ideologies. And, and it, when they do that, they really truncate the explanatory domain of the concept of ideology. Because I think once you recognize that the general concept can encompass revolutionary ideologies, then it looks like the, the domain of phenomena that um, the concept of ideology can explain is much, much greater than if you just stuck with the status quo conception. Mm -hmm. Catherine. Thanks for this talk. It was really great, really interesting. Uh, I guess I want some clarification on this last point about implications for moral and political philosophers. Um, this idea that if we support revolution, we should consider whether we're in the grip of a revolutionary ideology. What, it seems like a lot of uh, the recommendations coming out of political philosophers have to do with like liberal ideals and values. And so would you say that those count as ideologies uh, on your view, or yeah, if you could clarify a bit there. Look, I, I think that you can you can have a reasoned position according to which there's a need for fundamental revolutionary change in society, and in some cases, depending on the society, even for uh, uh, violent revolution. I don't think there's any doubt about that, and I don't think you you necessarily have to be in the grip of an ideology to hold those views. Right? You might have certain sort of liberal cosmopolitan views about human rights, for example, about the importance of democracy, um, making government accountable. And then you might see a regime which completely fails on all of those. And you think that the only uh, prospect for improvement is revolution, not reform, that the regime is just not reformable. And so I don't think there's anything in that as far as it goes that um, uh, 
means you're in the grip of a revolutionary ideology in the sense of ideology that fits under my general concept. But here's the question that I'm worried about. I'm worried that it might turn out that the only sort of systems of belief and attitudes that are really effective in bringing about revolutionary change are revolutionary ideologies, not the kind of clean, nice sort of view that you and I would subscribe to. Uh, and, and this leads to another deeper question, and I just pose it, I don't know the answer to it at all, but you know, there are some uh, social theorists who believe that in any modern, complex, ethnically pluralistic society, you have to have hierarchy of some kind. You have to have some people exercising more power over others than the others exercise over themselves. And they contrast this with the, the relatively egalitarian character of uh, hunter gatherer societies, right? I mean, I don't actually think they were egalitarian. There's a lot of evidence that they were very patriarchal in most cases, but set that aside. There was no sort of general hierarchy in these earlier societies. But then when you get the agrarian revolution and you get these large complex uh, societies, say with city-states in Mesopotamia, you get tremendous hierarchy, right? You get God kings and stuff. And for the rest of human history, every society is characterized by some kind of hierarchy or other. Now, it might turn out, some people think this, that the only way you can have a workable hierarchy and hence a workable modern complex society is by having a shared ideology. But if ideologies are like I think they are and like critical thinkers think they are, then that means that the price of having effective social coordination in a modern large scale pluralistic society is that you're gonna have some degree of oppression. Now it might turn out that some ideologies are more oppressive than others. But in other words, the idea is that ideologies are needed to make hierarchies work, but they make them work in such a way that they always provide opportunities for the people at the top of the hierarchy to abuse their power, to act in an oppressive way. And then the goal would be not to eliminate that, but to reduce it. Okay, So that's that's one possible implication. That, that, that is that you, you can sort of look at history as a struggle between hierarchs and people that resist it, resist hierarchy. And these and are so, like political hierarchies, hierarchies of office and political power, not necessarily social hierarchies like caste systems. And I think they, I think they to work together. But even if you just focus on uh, political hierarchies, um, you know, there's there's always a kind of uh, resistance to them. And there are two ways to look at this sort of perpetual struggle. One is that you know uh, we want to end hierarchy. The other is that no, that's too ambitious. We need hierarchy of some kind for social coordination in a complex uh, society, large-scale society. And the question is, uh, how can we tame a hierarchy? And then the, the further question is, can you have a hierarchy in which there are no significant opportunities for oppression on the part of the hierarchs, the people at the top? Or is there always going to be, for any hierarchy that works to do the job it needs to do in a modern complex society, is it always going to create opportunities for oppression? And then the question is, how do you reduce that risk of oppression? Are there some forms of hierarchy that are less toxic than others? So I think you know that's a, a natural sort of path of investigation, a set of questions to think about once you take on the idea that um, there can be revolutionary ideologies and that um, when revolutionary ideologies uh, succeed in bringing about revolution, it doesn't necessarily mean the end of oppression. It may just mean a new form of hierarchy with new oppressors. And historically, this is typically what's happened. Uh, now, you might say, well, it didn't happen in the, in the case of the American Revolution. Well, I'm not, the American Revolution is sort of a weird revolution. I'm not sure it's really a revolution in some ways, but you know, it was the secession from an empire. Um, and it, it mainly transported uh, a lot of the political values of the British system uh, to, to the new country that was established. Um, but it did in fact um, embody a continuation of the oppression of uh, slaves uh, and, and 
the oppression of Native Americans. Um, and I, I don't know whether there was a connection between the sort of constituent ideas of the American Revolution, the thing you might call the ideology of the American Revolution, and the preservation of those forms of oppression. I, I, I have to think more about that. But um, it, it's very hard to find examples of, of, of revolutions that uh, ended oppression rather than shifting uh, to new forms of oppression. Mm. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's great. Um, next question from Ka Colleen. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, so, so I, I had a um, just an observation and a question for you. So, the observation is this: this uh, the work on revolutionary ideology is really interesting as a potential resource for explaining why um, transitional justice so often fails. Um, so the, the sort of aspirations for transformative change not playing out and not, not duplicating the same oppression as before, it takes a different form. Yep. Um, so that's really helpful and useful. Um, also, I think this applies to decolonization. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, so the, the question was, was about um, sort of the, the comments that you were making at the end about what gains traction and what doesn't in philosophy and um, discourses and looking at the Stanford Encyclopedia. So how much, I, the short version of, of the question is, um, how much of this do you think has its roots, uh, the, the marginalization of what's really interesting work and especially relevant for the, the world, so to speak. Um, traceable to the emphasis on ideal theory and how much do you think it is? Um, you know, yeah, I, well, I think that's a big part of it. I think that indulging an ideal theory exclusively uh, really uh, is a great way of avoiding uh, certain topics uh, and that it really truncates the, the, the scope of the research agenda. I'm very suspicious about ideal theory. I'm very suspicious about the distinction between ideal and non-ideal theory, but uh, let me just say something that may sound a little extreme, but um, I think there, there are sort of two different ways that people do philosophy, and uh, here's the way I try to do it. I try to look at real problems, um, and then I go and look to see whether there's any philosophical literature that illuminates them, and often I don't find any. Uh, the other way is to start with philosophical literature and find problems in the literature. Now, the problem with that is that the literature is very path dependent, right? It might have started out having some initial contact with reality, but then it takes on a life of its own and people lose sight of the problem that we hope generated the literature. And instead, they just start responding to things in the literature. And it's like, it's like a planet spinning out into the universe further and further from the home base of the reality that it was supposed to be dealing with. And so I think um, ideal theory, you know, the idea of ideal theory really promotes this in a way, but it, it's, it's, or it synergizes with, I think there are two things going on. One is just sort of the way you make your way in the profession is by responding to something that's already in the literature. That's the easiest way. That's the easiest way to get a, a paper accepted, right? It's much harder to initiate a new dialogue, uh, something that isn't already in a literature. So there's a kind of perverse incentive that I think leads people to act in ways that, that, that makes them not engage with a lot of the real problem. I mean, I think you're a great example of somebody who really does it the right way. I mean, you know, you look at, you, you look carefully at the empirical work on uh, issues relevant to transitional justice and then you develop a theory from that and i think that's that's exactly the way to do it that's great so any other questions comments reactions Catherine, just following up on that um so yeah, we want philosophical work that illuminates these real problems, but we also need normative concepts and we need to understand values so that we can evaluate them and make and make prescription prescriptive claims 
Um, and so if you think of ideal theory in, in that way of developing those tools, then it's much less pernicious. Would you agree I, with that? Look, I agree. I, I didn't mean to, to say that, you know, we should give up being philosophers and just be second rate empirical science or something. You, you need to, the, the trick is to combine the normative anal normative conceptual analysis with the relevant empirical uh, information. And th this is very hard. I mean, you know, I found as the years have gone on that there is no problem that I'm really interested in that doesn't require interdisciplinary input. And of course I can't provide it myself. So what I've done mainly is to uh, identify really good collaborators in other disciplines, people like Robert Cohan, for example. Um, and I find it a little disturbing that um, philosophers who at least say they want to deal with real world issues don't do more co-authored work with people in other disciplines. Uh, you know, if you look at science, all the work is co-authored. So it's basically, there are no single author scientific articles I know of. Uh, and so I think, you know, we need to, uh, the problem is if you don't do that, if you don't engage closely with people who are really good in the disciplines that are not your disciplines that are relevant to your work, then you may be a sort of naive consumer of empirical research in other disciplines, and you may be prone to cherry picking, you know, you just look at the stuff and you find something that agrees with what you already wanted to say, and that's the part of the literature that you emphasize. It's really hard to be a savvy consumer of information from other disciplines. And the only way I do it, you know, it's, it's the novice expert problem in social epistemology, right? The only way I do it is I try to step back and identify people who are better at discerning what's the good research in that domain and then work with them. Um, so, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing all these sort of uh, grand recommendations, but I guess... Uh, no, I think it's really interesting, and I think we don't talk enough about um, methodology and, and where we should be going in political philosophy, so I, I love it, and I, I think I agree with everything you say, but I am, it sounded as if um, you were suggesting also that maybe uh, normative concepts or theories could actually be, um, could come out of looking at real philosophical problems. Is that, is that something... No, I, I think that, well, I think I don't, I, I think you have to bring some uh, normative assumptions to the empirical literature uh, to begin to even make sense of it or see why it might be significant. But I think that uh, your engagement with the empirical literature can lead you to modify your moral assumptions in appropriate ways. So, uh, you know, in a, in a way, it's sort of a reflective equilibrium kind of process. Um, you know, you might, for example, if you, if you came to have a, an understanding of how actual revolutions work and came to have a pretty pessimistic view about the good that can be produced by revolutions, then you, you might revise your sort of initial simple assumptions that, well, you know, the violent overthrow of a regime is, is uh, perfectly okay if it's bad enough or something like that. I mean, you know, so I, I think there can be a kind of feedback between the empirical work and the normative work, but I'm not saying that you, you, you don't bring, you have to bring a conceptual framework and uh, normative commitments to your investigation of, of the real world problem. It's just that I think you should view all that as provisional, as subject to possible revision in the light of what you learn about things. I mean, let me give you a concrete example. Okay, think about immigration, right? Um, I used to have different views about immigration before I started, uh, before I became a member of a group called Samaritans of Tucson. And, and what, what we do in Samaritans is we, we do what we call patrols. We take food and water and medical aid uh, to the, the, the migrant trails on, on the border. Tucson is only 50 miles from the Mexican border. And you know, before that, I had a kind of abstract view of, <laughs> of immigration policy, but uh, since I've seen the tremendous suffering and the huge number of deaths uh, that occur, I mean, we find human remains pretty frequently, and we find people who are on the, on the verge of dying. Um, you know, I've come to think, well, look, um, maybe if uh, a putative right, like the right of a sovereign state to exclude people, if the exercise of that right under real world conditions 
predictably produces huge suffering and death and human rights violations. Uh, it feeds the existence of, of cartels and traffickers who abuse people. It uh, feeds the existence of a culture of brutality on the part of border patrol agents, very well documented. Then um, there are two ways you might go with, in terms of philosophical theory, you might say, well, yes, there is still this right to exclude all those people. It's just that sometimes you shouldn't exercise a right uh, because the effects of doing it are, are disproportionately bad. The other is to make you rethink whether you really had the right conception of the right. That is, the, maybe, maybe the right to exclude people isn't as extensive as you thought it was. And either of those lines of thinking wouldn't even occur to you, I think, if you weren't aware of uh, just how horrible the effects of trying to exclude people from immigrating under conditions in which there's huge demand for, for crossing the border, right? Uh, and if you didn't understand what, what all the real world implications of it were. Uh, so I, I think, you know, that's a case where, um, it's not, I mean, you could, you could come to have those views not by having sort of firsthand experiences like I've had that engage the moral imagination very quickly, vividly. You might get it by just reading all of the statistics about deaths and suffering and reading the testimony of people, of women who've been raped by uh, uh, the, the, the guides uh, that, that bring them across the border. Um, you could get it that way, but the, but the point is that uh, engagement with the with the concrete realities, either firsthand or, or secondhand, might lead you to revise some of your initial moral assumptions. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions, reactions, comments? No, I feel like I'm I, I'm kind of trying to disentangle a little bit the kind of conceptual area. So we have transitional justice, this moments of, of kind of shifting from one state of affairs to, to another. We have, as you said, we move from um, status quo supporting type of ideology to a new ideology. So there's this kind of the transition, the shift. And um, I mean, ideally, I'm hoping to model it, model this in theoretically at some point. But um, and then I'm thinking again, this on the back of the the, the resistance movement and and um, disruption. And you seem to, to to sort of say like, yeah, is the new revolutionary ideology, or I'm wondering, is that just as it were a reaction, a, a, a disruptive? Um, move as you were or what is it that creates a, creates the condition for its momentum you know why is it that yeah it's not just a disruption or a resistance does that need to kind of happen i'm thinking in terms of like um scott's uh, distinction between private or was it uh, hidden hidden transcripts and over transcripts like when is it that you kind of your resistance um explodes in the public as it were you 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 talk truth to the to yeah the you know, uh, and... uh, scholars of the french revolution are really preoccupied with that problem right because uh on the one hand it looks like the french revolution was a kind of sudden um unpredictable event uh, but some people including tocqueville thought that it really wasn't as much that much of a discontinuity uh with the ancien regime and I think that, you know, reading people like Palmer and Fure, you get the idea that um, there were a bunch of factors that had been brewing for a long time, but then they came together at a particular point. <clears throat> and um, there was a, 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 a sort of seismic shift in uh, consciousness on the part of some people who were able to convey those ideas to to the masses. And I think if you look at what happened in the when the, the General Assembly was convened, the first time it had been convened since I think 1614, and it was convened because the, the monarch was running out of funds and, and had to have authorization of them. So he convenes the, the General Assembly. And um, 
there's a, a, a tremendous shift because in in uh, up until that point, most people have been thinking that it was a question of a bad bargain with the aristocracy and the monarchy. We needed them. They were supplying something valuable, but they were taking too much in proportion to what they were giving. It was sort of the bad bargain model. But then at a certain point, there's like, we don't need them at all. We're, we don't want to negotiate a new bargain. We want to get rid of them. Okay, And this, this really comes out in, in, in what is the third estate, but then the idea is, is taken up. And that's just a a radical transformation. Now, uh, Thoreau and Palmer and other people think that what happened was that the monarch, beginning with uh, Louis XIV, had been basically uh, stripping power from the aristocracy in order to avoid them challenging the monarchy, right? Because the history of the Middle Ages is the history of people trying to establish a monarchy and their feudal barons and lords counteracting them. Okay, And so what what, what happens at the beginning with Louis is you sort of concentrate the upper aristocracy at Versailles, give them basically nothing to do except have fun and uh, exhibit their status. Uh, but then, uh, and, and they're no longer really playing the role of the sort of martial aristocracy, right? Uh, like the people in the early Middle Ages. And at a certain point, people, the masses say, well, look, these people have all sorts of privileges and status and they claim superiority, but they're doing nothing for us. They're doing nothing. And so that, that's the beginning of the disintegration of the, of the bad bargain model of resistance and the, and the replacement of it with something much, much more radical. That is that it's the people that are sovereign and these groups that have been the hierarchies aren't even part of the people anymore. That's just a really radical idea. Now, uh, most historians of French Revolution think that this only came about because there'd been a huge increase in literacy in France and that Enlightenment ideas, especially Rousseau, had become really prominent uh, across the whole literate uh, population of France. Uh, but I think, you know, if, if there's any revolution in which you can say it was really ideas that were powerful, it was the French Revolution. And it were, they were philosophical ideas, but they were given a certain twist, which turned them into an ideology in the sense that I'm talking about and made them uh, powerful resources, not just for ending the current mm -hmm. oppression or constituting new, new forms of oppression. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, when does a revolutionary ideology spread and become effective? That's the huge question. <laughs> And I think that's a social science question. It's not really a philosophical question, but it's, it, it may be important for philosophers to understand the answer to that question in order to take a normative position on revolutions or certain kinds of revolutions in order to critique revolutionary ideologies. Yeah, yeah. I guess, I mean, for me, it's important because I was, I was wondering, like, are we dealing with a new ideology where it's just the social movement that is contrary? Yeah, I think that's, that's a challenge. That's a huge question. I mean, uh, I, I think there can be social movements without ideologies, at least in the sense that I'm talking about. And I guess one question is, can there be sort of non-ideological social movements that are really effective in overthrowing severely yeah. uh, long-standing oppressive regimes? Uh, I mean, you know, you, you, I think you need to look at the civil rights movement in the United States, for example. I don't detect any elements of an ideology in the sense that, or, or I don't detect sort of full-blown elements of ideology and the general concept that, that I've been uh, advancing in, in that movement at all. And I don't think um, that um, the civil rights movement itself produced new forms of oppression. I think that some people have adopted an interpretation of the struggle for racial equality, which may in fact lead to some forms of oppression. Uh, but that I think that's a, a, minor, a relatively minor, I, I'm thinking of, of, of things like, uh, you know, some universities, somebody comes to, to be a speaker and they're branded as a racist and then they're not allowed to speak. Uh, now, I think there's, there are probably some people that shouldn't be allowed to speak in some venues, uh, 
uh, or at least uh, you shouldn't sort of convey the idea that they're they're being sponsored by the university, something like that. But one of the uh, effects of this idea of sort of sorting and labeling, you know, well, they're a sexist, they're a racist, we don't need to listen to them, is that it really, uh, it really is oppressive and it, it prevents uh, engagement. And of course, it's, it's subject to abuse in terms of the expansiveness of the label sexist or racist, right? So it, it might be that, you know, in very indirect way, out of the struggle for civil rights, you you've led to some phenomena that are oppressive, but I don't think it's anything like uh, the directness and the magnitude of the oppression that, that has come out of uh, effective revolutionary ideologies. That, that's helpful. And if I just clarify one, one thing, I'm wondering, yeah, I, I love the idea of the, the, the bad bar, the bad bargain. And in a way it's interesting because like when we model Nash demand game, bargaining games, it's interesting that um, less powerful agent or group would be accommodating with modest demands, modest bids that he makes over the, distributing the resources as it were, precisely because it's, that's better than nothing. And in a way, you sort of like, okay, you know, that's uh, at least I get something out of this deal rather than nothing. But when that low bid that they get is so low to be so close to nothing, that's when basically um, a, a rejection, basically yes. a bad deal is happening. And that's when kind of revolution and this. Uh, this yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm interested in. And when, when the perception of the bargain, it, you know, is that it's so one sided. It may result in a sort of rejection of the whole bargaining framework. That is, we're not we're no longer thinking about how to get a better deal. Instead, we're rejecting the idea of a deal. And I think that if you look at this sort of perpetual hierarchs and resistors, in the you know in the early stages, uh, it's not even thought of as a bargain. It's thought that well, the, the king is divine, or the king is the descendant of the gods, and that's just the way it is. You know, they just have this power, and it's rightful power. Then you get, uh, uh, you know, for example, in, in uh, ancient China, the idea of the mandate of heaven, which is sort of, well, you know, the ruler is supposed to provide certain things, and if he doesn't, then he doesn't really have the authority anymore, right? So there's implicitly the idea that they've got to do something, and then the question is, who gets to decide whether it's a good bargain or not, whether it's an adequate bargain? And once you get the idea that somebody other than the priesthood or the hierarchs themselves have an authoritative voice as to whether it's a good bargain, things change enormously. Uh, and, and, and then uh, the next step is sort of, uh, you know, at, fighting for a better bargain. And then the next step is rejecting the bargaining framework and no longer thinking of the relationship between the rulers and the ruled as a bargain between uh, parties that have their own um, appropriate interest on their own, but instead thinking of the rulers as simply the agents of the people, right? As having no independent uh, entitlements at all, that they're only entitled to what they need in order to be the effective agents. So uh, uh, anyway, I've been working on this for a long time, and I have a, a paper coming out in a volume of social philosophy policy soon on this perpetual struggle, and I'm trying to work it up in, into a book. But I think that... Um, in terms of moral change, I think many of the most important moral political concepts are generated by this struggle between hierarchs and resistors. Uh, concepts like rule of law, rights, sovereignty, constitutionalism. Um, I think these are, um, I think that both sides make moral appeals. Hierarchs make moral appeals to justify their superior power, the resistors make moral appeals to challenge it. And they don't operate with a fixed stock of moral concepts. Instead, uh, through the strategic interaction of hierarchs and resistors, uh, you get a process that's productive of new moral concepts, uh, including some of the most uh, important ones that we have. So anyway, that's, I don't know whether that's philosophy or not, but that's what I'm Interested. I'm increasingly uninterested in the question of whether what I'm doing is philosophy or not. 
Well, uh, solve the problem or at least eliminate it. It's <laughs> interesting and what at least I think is important. Uh, and I think, you know, it's philosophical to some degree, but maybe not as much as some people would want given their, their fairly narrow conception of philosophy. And it's just to, well, it's, it's the role of kind of the new revolutionary ideology, in a sense, to sort of establish this glue solidarity of the resistant group. Is that how you say it? Um, sort of yeah. By the kind of the, the yeah the justification of their cause. Yeah, it's 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 got to um, unite people, yeah. and it's unite them under a revolutionary leadership. Yeah. Um, if it's, if it's going to be effective, right? Um, and often there's a huge contest for who's going to be the revolutionary leadership. I mean, uh, you know, that there are uh, people, different people are aspiring to be the leaders of revolution and they're in a deadly conflict with each other. They liquidate each other. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, you have to have leadership, but leadership in the absence of institutions, right? Uh, and the leadership has to be strong enough and it has to be able to gain uh, a sense of perceived legitimacy in the masses and it has to be able to motivate the masses in a unified way. And the problem is that uh, the, the groups that achieve this may be the most ruthless groups and the ideology they promote may be one which uh, fosters the idea that if you question those leaders, you're a traitor. Right. So, uh, and, and once that dynamic is in place, you can see why uh, it's likely that the regime, the new regime that those people produce, is going to be oppressive. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Thank you so much, Alan. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I guess. Um, <laughs>